By deleting the adjective, I'm not trying to be an it. I'm not trying to lose my motherhood, the fact that I'm 45, the fact that I'm female. We assume that all women are weak, right? That they can't lift as much or they can't run as fast as a 140 pound female. I was on par with a lot of the 140 pound males. It's a rotten point. seed that grows and you feel it and you regret it in those late hours of the night when everything's quiet. Like For the rest of your life. Yes. Lisa, welcome back to the Jedberg Podcast. Thanks for having me, friend. This is a third for you, and that is a very small group of people who have come on the Jedberg Podcast three times. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So we had you on 16. We told your story. Yes. Came back on 34. We sat down with General McChrystal. Yes. Both of those awesome episodes. And I felt like over the last couple of years that I've known your story. Like I felt like we really got into so many different things. But now I sit here with not only Lisa Jaster, but author okay, of <laughs> Delete the Adjective, which has just come out. I've read it. And now Thank there you for are, reading it, by the way. I it was appreciate great. that. It was great. There are so many things that I had no idea. And I laughed. I cried. I was like was so many memories, re- re- repressed <laughs> memories that had came back from you telling the story of going to ranger school and that whole experience, I was shocked at times because when I went to ranger school in 2005, there was no talk of having women attend ranger school. There was no talk of having women in combat arms. And so to see through your lens of what that experience was like and understanding that I went to ranger school once, Okay, for the, for the 61 days. You're supposed to do it that way, just so you know. That's how it's supposed to work. I believe is the preferred method. You did it in six months, and yes. there were some, you had some great lines in there about, you know, I was at Ranger School for like two and a half months or something, and I was on day zero. Ouch. Yes. <laughs> but the important thing is you made it. Yes. And we're going to talk about that. Special thanks to Long Tab Brewing. We're here in San Antonio, day two. Had the opportunity yesterday to spend the whole day with Green Beret Foundation. We're putting together a really important educational series on the programs that Green Beret Foundation is championing for all of our for our special operators, our Green Berets out there who are transitioning. And then right before you came in, was able to sit down with Dave Holland, founder of Lawn Tab Brewing, and uh, sampled the Jedberg beer. Was in here last night doing my research. Oh, okay, yes. had to research. understand exactly what the environment <laughs> was, what the food was, what the beer was, but doing my research and really great place that they've that they've built here and creating a lot of impact for a place that's only been here for three years. And I went from the beer to the coffee. So that's that's what we're on. You went right the wrong now. way. <laughs> I think I did go the wrong way. I'll go back to the beer for the flight home. Lisa, we talked a lot about your story. OK, we've talked a lot about the importance of closing the gender gap a single standard you've called it delete the adjective the book is called delete the adjective you said adjectives don't define you they describe you yes what does that mean by deleting the adjective i'm not trying to be an it i'm not trying to lose my motherhood the fact that i'm 45 the fact that i'm female but there are certain things in our life that matter and they matter based on merit like i don't want a doctor that fits some sort of adjective group, that fits in some sort of bucket. If somebody's gonna operate on my husband, I want it to be the best damn doctor in the whole wide world. I don't care male, female, black, white, gay, straight, like none of that stuff matters. It doesn't mean, it doesn't describe that human, but it doesn't matter to me. And I think the same is true in our military service. We put on our uniform, we've gotta delete those adjectives because it's the mission accomplishment that has to be first and foremost. When you talk about your motivation to go to ranger school, because if there is a place that is going to use adjectives, is going to define people by their adjectives institutionally, yes. right? And whether it's right or wrong, you can argue that all day long. It's, we're past it now, so it doesn't even matter. It's not a conversation because it is integrated now. But that would have been the place yes. where, that, where, where they're going to say very clearly, women can't do this. Men must do this. You were given the opportunity when it was presented to you. Why go? What was the motivation? What were you trying to prove? Were you trying to prove something? 
Fran, I think that's the funniest part about it for me is when my sergeant major, of course, God bless him and hate him at the same time, when he tried to talk me into it and completely failed, um, <laughs> completely failed, <laughs> love you, Robbie Payne, but no, uh, he called my husband and between the two of them, they started kind of pushing me in that direction. And I said, you know, there's plenty of women who are going to do this that are younger, they're, they've still got a fire in their belly. And both my husband and my star major were talking about the fact that the fact that you don't want to prove something, the fact that you're not itching to be a first, in, and the fact that you do have Afghanistan in 2002, Iraq in 2003, and a plethora of experiences in leadership, you are the right candidate. You have that background and you have the the willingness and the need to do it without the I need to make a name for myself kind of aspect I didn't want to prove something I just wanted to say hey listen we've been serving next to you here's my favorite example is Fran when you read the book you remember Sassafras Mountain oh yeah. you remembered those swamps if you look at that story and deleted probably maybe 50 pages of it it could have been your story. Yeah. Well, maybe a lot more because you went through a lot faster. <laughs> but the point is, I didn't have a different experience than you did. And that's that's why it needs to be gender neutral. That's why it needed to be me is because I wanted it to be, I just wanted it to be an awesome leadership experience. Well, when we talk about these descriptors, when we talk about these adjectives, you said, that you wanted to be feminine and badass. Yes. I have had the opportunity over the last, we're now in the third year of the right. Jedberg podcast. And, and one of the things that I pride myself on, I'll, I don't normally try to pat myself on the back because I wake up every day and still think we suck and we do everything <laughs> wrong and my, my, beat up my team about it all day long. But I do think we've done a really good job of highlighting a lot of amazing women who have done absolutely incredible things along a gender neutral standard. Right. And prove, and we've proven this, you know, and you were, I think the first story that we told on the podcast where I said, this is, this is a thread. This is a through line. That's mm -hmm. going to be really important to me as I develop this out over the course of the next couple of years. How do you be, become feminine and badass? My favorite way of describing it is when I'm in uniform, I, it's not that I don't want people to open the door for me, but I want to be a peer and I want to be thought of as a peer. If, if we've got to do the duffel bag shuffle and carry gear on and off in helicopter, done it God knows how many times in theater, I don't want somebody to think that they have to grab my stuff. Now, if I take R&R &R while I'm deployed, I want to wear mascara and I want to be taken out dancing and I want my husband to order my dinner for me. I don't want to lose my femininity, but when I'm at work, I'm not leading with it. And there is a lot to be said for finding that balance. And I feel so bad for, for guys who have to date women like me. Like, when is it okay to open the door? When is it okay to order dinner for you? Like, you can open my MRE for me, I guess. I, I, I don't know. But I do want to live in, in both worlds. I don't want to be limited. And I think if we want to talk about blurring gender lines, there's guys out there that want to be more involved with their kids, mm -hmm. but society says, well, it's, it's my wife's job when the kid's sick to take the day off work. Well, how many dads would love those those really, really cool days when you I would get to love be, it. yes. I would love to do that. Right, and it's okay. It's yeah. okay to be both. We live in a town like that in, in, in Connecticut, and my wife had to go into the city last week because there's a train line that goes into Manhattan. Well, you've been, you've been yeah. last. And um, she said on the way home, she got off the train, and she was on the, late, the later train coming home, and got in about 9.30, and she said, I was the only woman on the train. Yeah. It was all, it was all men. And I, and I said, you can be the only woman on the train every day if you, if you have a job that demands that and right. that's a decision that we make. I have no problem staying home with the kids. I love it. Yeah. So I would do that all day long. The single standard is important for a lot of reasons. You get into a lot of them in the book. We've talked about a number of them. I truly believe that great organizations create a culture in which this single standard is the norm. Yes. It's embedded from the top down in everything that they do. I mentioned conversations we've had. We've talked to Don Riley, winner of America's Cup. 
one of the most phenomenal sailors, men or women in history. I mean, we've talked to Sarah Apgar, one Shark Tank has created Fit Fighter. Mm -hmm. We've talked to Shailen Lori not too long ago at Wadapalooza, yeah. who was an Army officer, first honor graduate at the Infantry Officer Basic yeah. course in the Army. You might know her. Yeah. Um, and a phenomenal CrossFit, CrossFit athlete. Yes. Whoop my ass all day long. Yes. I wouldn't even compete with her. <laughs> it, we talked to Allison Brager. I don't Brager. say yes because I'm agreeing. I'm just saying <laughs> well, you need to agree. You too, need, so. <laughs> uh, we talked to Allison Brager, who, who's yes. a mutual friend of ours as well. Uh, and then over the course of the last, the last several months, I've had Jesse Graff as a co-host. Phenomenal. Who's, who I, has I now stalk her after you introduced her to me via <laughs> uh, your podcast. She is phenomenal. I could say nothing else. She's great. Yes. She's great. We, we, we had her episode on episode 30 and then brought her back for the Wadapalooza series. She's going to come back and do the Sandlot series this year again. But you talk about setting the example in professional sports. Yes. About how you do win at that level and compete at that level. General Tovo and I, Ken Tovo, former USASOC commander, chairman of the board at Green Beret Foundation, talked about bringing women in the special forces and the importance and how that's changed and advanced the regiment and be able to do that. How do you build a culture in an organization where the leaders are comfortable deleting the adjective and putting merit at the top of the list? I think a lot of the problems we have is we associate these adjectives with certain things. And let's talk about women in the military, just because it's a super easy example. We assume that all women are weak, right? That they can't lift as much or they can't run as fast. Are women weaker than men in general? Yes. We're, we're not going to deny science, biology, testing, you know, the fastest man in the world will, all, I think, will always be faster than the fastest woman in the world. Does that mean that, that that's what we're looking for? The military isn't looking for the fastest. They're looking for a standard, a one standard based on the job that needs to be done. And what I found specifically in Ranger School that as a 140 pound female, I was on par with a lot of the 140 pound males. So was the issue gender integration or was it strength? So if the standard is based on the requirements, then it's easy to test requirements versus saying, well, women can't do this because physically they're not strong enough. Well, that's, that's not the answer. Jesse Graff is a great example. How many men can do the stuff that she does? Well, I went to the ninja gym with her, and oh, God. this guy cannot do that. God bless you. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> like, that she, had to be so humbling and, for and, Oh, and she did her absolute best to coach me as best she could until we got to the point where it's like, I, can't, I just can't do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sweet, but no, no. And, and look at that. So... Um, when you're talking about building an integrated organization, really sitting down and having the forethought to decide what is the requirement, what merit do we need, what what are we what are we asking for, and then backfill from there. And and sometimes there are benefits to different descriptors in the military, especially in the Green Beret community and the Special Operations community. Learned that bringing women into Arabic countries had a huge advantage. There are times when the the requirement is gender or diversity of visual diversity shall we say mm -hmm. there's an element of courage here too I and mean, we talk about leadership and so much of of leadership and effective leadership comes down to having a bias for action you know i, I, I give these leadership presentations and I, I teach these leadership seminars where i always tie so much back to effectiveness being in t having a bias to action you have to do something you can't just not do anything as you take us through the book you as we go through your journey you continuously come back to this theory that what was happening to you on the ground the decisions that were being made by the R by the ranger instructors by the company commanders the battalion commanders the ones who were responsible for giving you the the no go no go call it the no go no go or pass fail mm -hmm. in each one of your patrols and your evaluating graded exercises there's this theory and this feeling that you had that their decisions were being influenced so much by the policymakers, by people who were there to quote unquote protect you, look out for you. And so they inserted all this red tape, all these 
ancillary observers and this, mm -hmm. these other protocols that wouldn't exist for a normal class. And the byproduct of that is that in everybody's effort to make sure that the standard was not lowered, possibly the standard was actually increased. Can you talk a little bit about what that felt like? What was going on? What, what was that theory that you had and how you managed it? In a school like that, and, and luckily you've attended it, so you, you understand, but for anyone who hasn't attended it, it's, there's no right and wrong answer. There's, do I feel like in a combat environment under high stress, yep. you could lo lead a troop of soldiers under fire while you're exhausted, you haven't eaten in three days because you're, you know, all these bad situations, yes or no? That's really what they're answering. There is a checklist, but there's no way to know that ahead of time. So the ranger community and the ranger instructors are people who have been in the community for an extended period of time and, and they know what someone who's stressed out but still able to perform looks like. And so sometimes they pass people that look like they should have failed and sometimes they fail people because they know. They mm -hmm. know. And that's really hard for society and politics to comprehend yeah. and even to allow. Why is there no standard? Well, there is a standard. It's just, you can't describe it. It's a feeling. Would I want to share a foxhole with this person? Yes or no. And if they answer no, it's hard to pass somebody. Yeah. And now from, from the outside, not, not when they were dealing with us as individuals, but from the outside, they're just getting berated and getting so much negativity from the press. And, and a lot of people who say you have to pass someone or you don't have to, don't ever let a woman pass. So it became really complicated for those instructors and those leaders to, to navigate those waters. For me personally, what I wanted to do is, okay, well, I understand as being one of the first that that's what's going on. And that's the benefit of being 37 instead of 22 when I go through it, is when I see these guys come in and the RIs are looking at me going, you know your shit, but, and, and I know what's going through their head because I've been there, I've been in industry, I've worked construction, yeah. I worked oil and gas, like I know what those thought processes are. And, and so I was able to empathize, but that also means that if somebody had to volunteer, volunteer to carry the 240 or the 249 or the extra grenade launcher, I'm going to do it just so that I give them that one little edge of, you know what, she carried something every day. Yeah. You know, give them the tools they need to be able to confidently say to their peers, hey, I would share a foxhole with this soldier. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that that evaluation is is a hard part, you know, because you can look at some of the quantifiable things and say well was it their fault as a leader or not you know and we say in the army we say, i tell leaders all the time you're responsible for everything your organization does and fails to do is that true yes that's true but are you really responsible for you know what we call bravo right rifle you know laying in the prone and it's 42 degrees right. and slightly drizzling and they haven't slept in three days and you're preparing an op order and they fell asleep for two minutes right. and should you fail because of that? Or is there an element of personal discipline yes. that maybe that person should fail for that? Right. Right. And, and in, a, in an environment that you were put in here, nobody wanted to be, seemed like nobody wanted to be the one who was going to say, to, to be the first one to say, well, I let it go. It wasn't her fault. Right. And there's TV cameras there, too. So it before in previous iterations, when they walked through Dahlonega, Georgia, or they were in the um, the Appalachian Trail, nobody knew. Nobody cared. Yeah. But we had we had tourists taking pictures. Oh, my God, I see a girl. And I'd see those pictures being emailed to my husband from complete strangers. Right. So there was no, hey, you know, what happens at ranger school stays at ranger school. There's a couple of points of the book that I want to talk about. Uh -oh. I told you, I, I <laughs> laughed. It brought back so many memories and things I forgot about. Your hairdresser cried. Yes. And wouldn't cut your hair. Yes. But because, you know, we talked about the standards, but you know, there are some that are, that are not going to be uh, challenged at all. And that is, you got to cut your hair. You got to shave your head. Yes, definitely. But it also, but that is important for you because it also did start your donation because um, you donate your hair. Now, almost regularly. every team, 18 months, give or take. I donate 12 to 14 inches of my hair and been doing it since graduating from ranger school. 
See, so that that came out of it. That's great. There's an important. We talk on the podcast about how you prepare today determines success tomorrow. Pot, tagline that we have here. You said, "Don't get dropped for something you can prepare for." Yes. This is a really important concept. Not only as you, for all those seeking to go to ranger school, seeking to go to qualification course for special forces and selection or whatever. This is a life lesson. Definitely. What does that mean? I've got a kid who wrestles. Don't not make the tournament because you didn't make weight. Like if if you fail on the wrestling mats, fine, but make weight. You can't start. You can't you can't begin your adventure if you don't make it to the start line. And and it's a great way too to focus all your anxiety. Everyone when they're starting a new challenge has some sort of anxiety. So take that anxious energy and put it straight towards being the best you can be at those knowns because there's plenty of unknown unknowns yeah. but be solid on the knowns yeah you can't worry about those i mean it's, that's how i when i think about how i prepare for ranger school how i prepare for you know even even podcasts how i prepare for business how i prepared for uh, selection for special forces was all about i focus a lot on physical aspect mm-hmm. what do i know if i'm in the best shape that i can possibly be in right then whatever they throw at me might be a fraction of a degree easier because I don't have to worry about my physical conditioning. Exactly. And then see what happens. Yes. My brain works better since physically I'm, I can handle exactly. it. Exactly. You don't have the pain. You said adversity is important in building leaders. You talked about chipping your tooth. Uh, not many people know this, but in the bottom here, my tooth uh, is yeah. from uh, officer candidate school when you climb the ropes. Um, and so we used to climb the ropes and then they had this great idea of let's see who's strong. And they had the two ropes next to them, next to each other. And yes. they said, no legs, climb both ropes. Oh. When you got to the top, you had to, you had to ring the bell, but you have no hands. So how do you ring the bell? You ring the bell with your teeth. Oh God. So you put the string in your mouth and, you know, uh, officer candidate Richopi here one day <laughs> yanked it and ripped the front tooth forward and I laughed at your story of this because what did I do? I told nobody. Yep, I no. got down, blood coming down my face. I reset it into my mouth oh God. and I didn't chew with that section of my mouth until it reset. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Cause that's adversity. Yep. We got to get through it. That's pretty tough. But you tell your stories of this, these, you know, these micro moments. The reason why I bring it up is because we talk about adversity in this macro scale, but you build adversity in the macro scale through micro moments. Most definitely. Yes. And you've got to seize every opportunity to say, can I persevere through this? Now I don't, not advocating to not get your teeth fixed if you do something. Uh, but, yes. Yes. But, are those, but why are those moments important? Exactly what, what you're talking about. And, and I love saying that um, adversity doesn't build character. It reveals it, you know, in the, when you take these opportunities to do something hard or to suffer just a little bit, I use wrestling because wrestling's a super easy example, similar to military examples. But when you push yourself and you get used to, um, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, just suffering. You can't breathe. You got somebody who's 240 pounds on top of you trying to choke the life out of you. It's fine. You're you're safe the whole time, and you're realizing, hey, I can handle this, and I can move forward. Well, the next time I'm in an uncomfortable uncomfortable situation in the real world where I can't just tap and and tell my buddy, hey, you know, what the hell's wrong with you? You're you're, you're going a little too hard, too fast. I can I can go out in the real world and say, you know what? I've dealt with these smaller things. This is just a scalable version of what I went through this morning at jujitsu or. And, you know, building it into your children is important, too, because you don't even understand. You don't even know when they're going to hit those rough patches. Those little pieces of adversity give you the tools you need to deal with the big pieces of adversity down the line. Which I think also brings up another point that that you discuss in the book, which is having to train yourself and think about fully living in the am. What's that mean? Living in the and in the and, in am like now living oh. living in the in the now in the yeah. moment yeah well i had this experience where every time i we climbed a mountain that meant the next day we were going down the mountain and i had the pleasure of going through mountain phase twice which is by far the worst phase Absolutely of ranger the school worst phase. and I, yeah. there's nobody who disagrees no. with that you can talk blueberry pancakes no. and waffles all you want but 
There is no debate on mountains. No. And They're not even good blueberry pancakes. If you <laughs> ate one of those right now, you wouldn't even eat the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. You're not wrong, but, um, but I would... I would hike to the top of the mountains on mission day, you know, odd mission days when you're going up. And I would smile. And there was this great LT from the Mexican army. And he's like, why are you always smiling? I said, it's beautiful. Have you seen the sunset? Like, this is the most beautiful sunset I think I've ever seen. And he's like, how, how can you even see the sunset? I said, you got to look up. Yeah. And on at that point in time, a bunch of us actually took off our patrol caps and with marker wrote in our hats, and to this day it's still in my patrol cap, it says look up, nothing more than look up. Because if you're not living in the now, you're not looking, you're not living in the now. You miss all of the beauty. Yeah, my feet were bleeding, but I was thinking about bringing my kids back to uh, the Appalachian Trail to go yeah. hiking with them while at ranger school. What an awesome experience. Yeah, I was just thinking about that right before you said it, that you know, I remember being on the Appalachian Trail and people will ask me now, hey, have you ever hiked the Appalachian Trail? And it's, well, yeah. technically, <laughs> I believe I have. I think it was different than the way you may have done it, but right. I was on a portion of the Appalachian Ivy, Trail. <laughs> <laughs> the Army does not train followers. Okay, and I say this statement because this is something that I've been very big on this year and kind of one of my themes of 2023 and a lot of our episodes is that people will say, how do you build good leaders? When does someone become a leader? And the army and the military in general is great from the day you enter, even before that. And the recruit, you look at what's your recruiting videos. The army just launched a new recruiting campaign. Nobody ever says, come into the army we're going to teach you how to follow yeah they say come into the military and we're going to teach you how to lead yes and every single moment is about teaching you how to become a leader yes because when you breed people to be leaders from the very base level you're building a resilient organization of proactive thinkers who together are greater than themselves and when we have organizations who think well you're a follower right now now we're limiting people. We're constricting their thought. We're constricting their ability to execute at a high level. We're putting them in a box and telling them, well, you don't need to do that. Maybe, but maybe their ideas are great. Maybe they're better at it than anybody else. I say all this, but there is an element when you go to ranger school about just being a follower. Yes. Because you learn a lot when yes. you're not in those leadership positions. When others are in leadership, about yourself, about them. But from your perspective, why is it so important in an organization to train people as leaders from day one? So while you were starting that, you said something about putting somebody in a box when you tell them to be a follower. And I see it in the business industry. And you, like me, you've had your feet in the military and you've had your feet in corporate America. So you see the differences. And a lot of times in organizations, we like to take somebody who's an amazing individual contributor, not necessarily a follower, but an individual contributor. And then we suddenly think we are gonna put them in a leadership role and they're gonna excel. And it doesn't work that way. Once somebody has that in their mind that I'm going to, I'm going to move me to the X, it's hard for them to think about what it takes to move everyone else towards the X. And so, it's really important for the Army, and it's so important that at every promotion stage, enlisted or officer, there is a leadership school that correlates with that promotion. Because once you get in the mindset of, I just need to follow the cat eyes in front of me, you forget that there's a whole world that you need to look around. You need to look at your flank. You need yeah. to look at your left and right limits and see if there's anything else out there. And you can't do that if you, become t uh, if you start having tunnel vision. Yeah. You missed the sunset. Yep. Talked about not letting the quit in. Yes. We talked about it in, in episode 16. Why can we never let the quit in? Once you give it a foothold, it's there. You know, if you close the door and you're just, hey, I'm going to do this no matter what. It's really hard to transition that mindset. And and there are things in this world that you should quit. So one of the things that I've 
I've started doing is setting quit criteria because I believe you should never let the quit in. But when it becomes dangerous, so at Ranger School, I wrote out my quit criteria. What could happen where I could go home to my husband and my kids who sacrificed so much for me to go to this school and look them in the eyes and not be embarrassed if I quit? If I had a compound fracture in my lower leg, like, and it was that specific, a death in the immediate family. Like there was very few things. I think it, there might have been one other, but I couldn't even think about it. Anything else, I was staying. And, you know, in the, in the book, I draw it out, but, you know, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and I didn't know if he was going to make it to graduation. Well, that wasn't on my quick criteria. So that was not even allowed to enter my lexicon on whether or not I was going to stay. Like at no point in time did I consider quitting because there wasn't a death in my immediate family that I needed to go home to. There was nothing that, there was nothing I could do to take care of that. And because what, if I had let that in, then I don't know that I could have finished the school. I would have been worried about my dad and things at home and things that I couldn't take care of. And that's not, that's how, not how you achieve your goals by, by letting yourself get focused on all the reasons why you can't. Yeah, I tell people all the time that if you, you can fail. Yeah. Failure is okay. Yes. We're going to fail at things. And you can look back down the road on failure and say, listen, I put everything out there. I did everything I could, and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. And you'll go on and you'll succeed again. Yes. And you'll be a winner. But if you quit, even if you never quit anything again, you were still a quitter. It's a rotten seed that grows and you feel it and you regret it in those late hours in the night when everything's quiet. Like for the rest of your life. Yes. For the rest of your life. Ranger school is the premier leadership school in, in the army. I'd say in the military, people will compare it all the time to the special forces qualification course. I'm sitting here and long tab brewing. And so people will get upset with me for saying what I, what I probably am about to say, but it does not compare. It is, it is a different experience. It will, it tests every facet of you mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually for, for, for most, I think yes. <laughs> as well too, but it, it is a feat that can only be understood and shared by the others who have gone through that experience. And everybody's experience is uniquely different. Yes. And yes, there are parallels and there's things you understand but reading your story you know i i understand a lot of it but there's a lot that is unique to you it's inspirational you know i've told you that before as we've talked over over and over again over the last couple of years but i encourage everybody who seeks to better themselves improve themselves not let the quit in understand that when you set a goal for yourself we talk about winning no matter the challenge in, in the, on this podcast. Get out there, have a bias for action, achieve your goal, and stop at nothing to do that. You've set that example. You continue to do that. You're going to go from here, as we've talked about all this, jump into mom phase, <laughs> yes. go, to, go to your son's track meet. We've watched him grow over the last couple of years on Instagram. That's been cool to see. But thank you for writing this book. It's called Delete the Adjective. It's your story. It's an inspirational one. Like I said, I've been there and I went straight through and I'm still motivated by this. Oh, so, thanks, thanks, Lisa. Brian. Appreciate you. American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.